what is this? We are coming to a consensus on how to fight poverty and restore upper mobility in America. Number one, we agree this needs to be fought. We agree far too many people are slipping through the cracks in this country. We agree that opportunity is lacking. We agree that this beautiful notion, the American idea, the condition of your birth doesn't determine the outcome of your life, is an idea that a lot of people don't believe in anymore. And if, and if there are some who don't believe in it, then it really isn't true universally at all. So it's our job to restore this. And this is what conservatives have been working on for years. And this is what is exciting. Tamar calls it the center-right movement. We've been spending so much time trying to figure out how we can better solve these problems, how we can take our principles, apply them to problems to offer really good innovative solutions that are effective. I will just say a few things on that, uh, other than to say that you have in front of you a very willing and a very engaged Congress ready to tackle this issue. We have spent years on this. In particular, we spent the last year putting together a very specific and coherent blueprint on reviving upper mobility and fighting poverty. Number one, and Robert Doerr is really good about this, uh, work works. We've got to do more to make it easier for people to join the workforce. We've got to do more to make it easier to transition people into the workforce. We have to remove the disincentives that are disincentivizing people from getting on the ladder of life and getting into the workforce. And we think we have innovative solutions to do that. Number two, we've got to stop displacing local poverty fighters. We cannot keep embracing this arrogant paternalistic notion in Washington that Washington knows best. In other words, we've got to stop the commodification of the poor. We've got to stop fighting this idea of poverty as if it's some you know, sterile, cold concept we don't like, and then create some big bureaucracy and, and program in Washington, and then parachute into communities and push them aside and say, we know what's best. We've got to stop doing that. Um, I think if you had to describe the war on poverty as noble as the effort was, um, this war is a stalemate. And what we learn when you actually go into communities is there are people who are doing tremendous work, who are fighting poverty eye to eye, soul to soul, person to person, who we all need to learn from. And so instead of displacing that good work, we need to support it, we need to back it up. The government has a very important role to play. It's maintaining the supply lines, but not dictating the front lines. And so that to me is one of the really important acknowledgements that we have to, that we have to express. Stop displacing civil society Stop pushing aside local, homegrown, proven poverty fighters. Get their stories told so that their success can be replicated. Cross-pollinate across the country. So get everything and everyone working hand in hand on the same page in the same direction. Civil society, faith-based charities, you know, secular charities, government and, every, and employers and the private sector and everybody in between. Right now, kind of fighting at odds with each other. So one of the things that we as conservatives want to do is make sure that everyone is working on the same page with the right incentives. Number three, test results. Uh, this, this is not partisan. Patty Murray and I wrote a bill, passed it into law a year ago, uh, creating an evidence-based policy commission. Some of the members are probably here in this, this room so that we can better measure the success of our efforts, better measure the success of programs so that we test results and we judge success in the war on poverty and the restoration of upper mobility, not based on effort, not based on how many programs we're creating or how many dollars we're sending, but based on results. Are we getting people out of poverty? Are we creating upper mobility? Does it work? So let's just focus on inputs to results. And if we do those fundamental things, make sure that we smooth the pathway to work, make sure that work always pays, remove these barriers, stop taxing people 80 cents on the dollar um, from taking a step into the workforce. Make sure that we don't displace civil society, that we work with and respect civil society and local poverty fighters and test our results. And with respect to just providing upper mobility on all levels of the scale of the income scale, we've got to close this skills gap and we've got to get economic growth. So that's a big full agenda. It involves things like tax reform, making America more competitive, um, making, it, making our industrial base more vibrant. It involves closing that skills gap, soft skills, hard skills, and everything in between so that people can get the skills they need and getting the employers and civil society involved in the pursuit of doing this. 
It involves giving, getting government to respect its limits and removing the barriers and then putting policies in place that get us the growth we need to produce the jobs and the opportunity, closing the skill gaps and going after fighting the really hard persistent problems with persistent poverty. And that is why we think this conversation is ready, it's ripe. Now we want to take this conversation, get it moving in the right direction, and then start putting results out there, getting bills passed. This is what we are serious about doing. It is a moment that I think should not be a partisan moment. This is one that we just see the evidence in front of us and go with what works. And so all I want to do is say thank you for doing this. I see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, we're very excited about this. We're very excited about uh, having the opportunity to tackle one of the more persistent and stubborn problems that we've been dealing with as a country. And we're excited about learning from the people on the ground who have made a difference and making sure that we can see more of that and removing these barriers and getting everybody on the same page. So thank you very much for being here and look forward to the conversation with Jerry. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you for bringing some of that Janesville weather to us this oh. morning. This isn't cold. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be 19 below zero on Sunday at home. We're getting 10 inches of snow on Saturday. In other words, Packers weather. Yeah, it, yeah. it is. Okay. It, this isn't cold. Um, I appreciate the chance um, to have the conversation. Uh, it, it's hard for me to start a conversation like this without talking about Jack Kemp. I, I wrote about Jack Kemp. You worked for Jack Kemp. His name is up there, as you noted. Um, if he were here today, uh, still preaching the uh, optimistic, happy, broad uh, tent, big tent brand of conservatism that he liked to talk about, what would he be pleased about? What would, what would he be displeased about in terms of where we are right now? Well, I remember we would have conservative meetings about fighting poverty and you could fit everybody around one table in Jack Kemp's office. Uh, so uh, seriously, I mean, it was like six people. Uh, so this is exciting just to see this effort. So I think he'd be ex really excited uh, if Jack were here or if his son were on time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <He's, laughs> <he's gonna laughs> we'll, we'll remind him you said <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, remind him I said that. <laughs> it, we're, we, it, it was, he would be excited that the ferment and that what I call the battle of ideas is really matured to the point where we have so many more people engaged in this fight. Um, my mentor, in addition to Jack Kemp, is Bob Woodson. And I met Bob through Jack back in the early 1990s. And, you know, Bob and I have spent a lot of time over the years traveling the country. And I just wanted, I just asked for a tutor. I just teach me, I want to learn. Um, I have these principles and I have good, good opinion on what, what they look like and how they work. Uh, I learned them from Jack Kemp, uh, but let's see, you know, how, how it works in reality. And what I've, um, what, what I'm excited about is more and more and more people. Um, I've been getting House Republicans to do this, are getting out in communities doing just this. Mm -hmm. So what I think Jack would be excited about is the engagement and the participation of so many people in the center right on this issue. I think what he would be really upset about is the polarization of our politics. Is just the the the, the He's a happy warrior. We're, we're, we think of ourselves as happy warriors. The glass of life is half full, not half empty. You appeal to the better angels of people. You have rigorous debates on ideas, uh, but, but it's, it's done in an inclusive way that's less polarizing. I think he'd be pretty upset about the polarization of politics today. Um, you talked, and, and I want to talk some more about the poverty agenda, but there was a, a related agenda that I think really emerged in this election and, and with the election of Donald Trump, which was the concerns of, for lack of a better term, the working class poor. Yeah. Um, and let me ask you this philosophical question. As a free market conservative, somebody who believes in the power of free markets and the primacy of markets, how do you then address the concerns of people uh, in this working class poor segment, which issued a kind of a primal scream in this election, that globalization and markets don't work for them? How do you, how do you deal with that concern? I, I, I attack the premise of the question, which is you're pretending that we've been operating with free market economic policies and we have not. So what we have are policies that have produced uh, slower economic growth um, and, and, and more disparity of income and less opportunity. Why? I think a lot of our own policies, our own government domestic policies have been a big cause for that. 
whether it's the poverty trap because the way our welfare programs are, are work, working or don't work, whether it's the regulatory state that is, that is really hurting jobs, especially small businesses, manufacturers, uh, whether it's just our tax policy that makes us extremely uncompetitive. Uh, I'll just give you my own story. I live in Janesville, Wisconsin. I live on the block that I grew up on. Um, most of the people I went to high school with uh, either went to the GM plant or something like that in, in Janesville. We, our big employer until 2009 was General Motors. They were there from, for about 85 years. And you could get a really good job there and do very well and have a very nice life. And your kids could do the same. And that just went. I mean, we lost that plant like that. We made Tahoes and Suburbans. Uh, now they're all made in Texas. And there really wasn't anything to replace those jobs. So these are like the guys I went to high school with. They either um, moved in the GM system because they had some seniority in the union, so they went to St. Louis or Kokomo, Indiana, and a couple of other places, Arlington, or they just did something else. A buddy of mine who um, I worked with him on an adoption case, two little girls from India, he and his wife adopted, he, he's the night guy at Quick Trip, which is a convenience store. So he went from a really good skilled trades job with great benefits, six-figure income, six figures at GM, to he's the manager at Quick Trip. Quick Trip is, um, you would think of 7-Eleven. It's Wisconsin's version of that. I actually worked uh, at the Quick Trip when I grew up in Hayes, Kansas. Did you really? I did. I don't know, Quick Trip went that far, went that far west. Uh, so uh, there's a perfect example, uh, I'll just say his first name, John, of the anxiety and the, the lack of opportunity and I can just give you stories in, in all throughout the Rust Belt, but Wisconsin is like that. So there was this, this huge anxiety. So what do we do about it? Well, I look at our tax laws. I see Johnson Controls, biggest company in Wisconsin, now has become an Irish company. Mm -hmm. um, their headquarters are moving to Ireland. Why? Ireland's got a 12.5% tax rate. Uh, Miller, we're, we're a big Miller town. You know, Miller Park in Milwaukee. Uh, we brew the beer there, but the headquarters are now overseas. You know, we're losing our base. We're losing our companies, we're losing our competitiveness, and then you take a look at all the, the bevy of regulations that are just making it really hard for, for better jobs to come and replace those jobs. And then the skills gap is a huge issue. We're beginning to grow local businesses, local manufacturers, you know, people with 50 to 150 jobs, but they're now, with all this atrophy we've, we've experienced, they don't have the skills to line up with it. We can't find welders in Wisconsin to do really good custom welding, which you can make a very good income as a custom um, high-skilled welder. And so uh, employers are now just taking, Robert and I are talking about this, are taking it upon themselves just to go train people. So we've got a situation where I think this election uncovered this. There are a lot of working class people who were doing well and are doing much, much worse who don't see good prospects in front of them, and who, who we don't have an education system that can help them acquire the skills that they need to get a better job, and that better job isn't there because we have bad domestic policy, which is making it harder for that better job to be created in the first place. So that is why this, this issue of upper mobility should not be a segment of this slice. We shouldn't be speaking to people as if they're in some class. We believe in class mobility and upper mobility, so we've got a multi-front um, policy war we're going to have, a battle of ideas, to deal with economic growth, American competitiveness, restoring jobs, manufacturing, closing the skills gap, and dealing with the welfare poverty trap so that we can get people unstuck from the poverty trap that they're in. And that, to me, is one of the biggest um, uh, messages we should get from this election. So you're, def you're defining an extremely broad agenda, not a narrow anti-poverty agenda. But in, in the prioritizing that you're going to have to do, where does the poverty program that you just described fit in? How Ex high a priority is it? It's, among, it's, the high, it's among the highest. And I don't see these things as mutually exclusive because I think what most of us, uh, because of where we come from, we're very familiar with, with the, um, the working class economic anxiety issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I'm from. But a lot of us had to, had to go and spend time in the persistent poor communities in rural and urban America just to see how persistent this is. Go to Appalachia, go to, I mean, there, I can list names. Well, you did it. Of places, and that, I think, is the more persistent problem that, that requires emergency surgery. And that, to me, is about the stuff that all the people on this, 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 this placard um, are talking about. Jimmy Kemp and I did a, with AEI, did a, a big summit in Columbia, South Carolina with Tim Scott, 
Um, we've been talking about these ideas. Now we want to execute these ideas. And I do believe that the multi-generational poverty, the persistent, stubborn, high poverty is what we need to go at right away. Because that to me is, is, is who is hurting the most. Yeah. And if we can help crack that code, all the rest of these problems get much, much easier to solve. And as you try to do that, what are the areas you anticipate you can get cooperation from Democrats on? And where are the areas where they're gonna We're gonna test you? it everywhere. Uh, I do believe that, I would like to think that, that fixing what I call the poverty trap, the benefit structure, the benefit cliffs, is something that we can all agree needs to be addressed. So if you take a person's benefits, uh, they'll have these benefit cutoffs that disincentivize taking the next step into the workforce. And the, the challenge is you can't sit in Washington, create a better formula to make sure that work always pays. You know, the Brits had the universal credit in England and they're working on this. We're a bigger diverse country with 50 states. It's harder to do that here. And so I really do believe that we need to get more local control involved so that we can customize benefits to the person's particular needs. And this is kind of the mistake I think we've made before. We think we can come up with a better mousetrap on the way benefits need to be structured, but everybody's got a slightly different problem. Everybody's got a slightly different benefit mix. And so I think you need to go more toward benefit customization. And what I'd like to think we could get consensus on is to break up the poverty monopoly. But there, is there a consensus that this trap exists? Yes, I think there is consensus. That's, I mean, I'm for childless adults for EITC, for example. Um, that's something that I think a lot of us agree on. I think that's a good way of helping pull people into the workforce and smoothing this benefit cliff. I would like to think we could get consensus on moving EITC from being some end of year lump sum payment to embedded in the paycheck. I think, it, it, I think it's, a, it's better if we do it that way. Uh, there are a lot of details involved in doing that, but that's something that I think we could get consensus on. I would also like to think, because if you just look at success in our communities, where we've broken up the poverty monopoly not just being the county welfare agency distributing benefits, seeing people as sort of a cog in a machine or a line item on a spreadsheet, but involving and in empowering other groups, whether it's Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, America Works, Lutheran Social Services, whoever, to be the actual um, distributor of benefits and, and, and the ones to have the navigator and uh, Catholic Charities in Racine, Wisconsin, perfect example. Uh, Fort Worth has a really good program on this where they actually are, they do the, they call it wraparound benefits. They basically try to come up with a benefit customization to work with a person with carrots and sticks, incentives and disincentives to get them from where they are to where they need to be and want, where they want to go. You have to break up the welfare monopoly in order to get that kind of dynamic writ large. So and I think, I'd like to think we can get consensus on that. So you're, you're essentially you're talking about energizing civil society. Yes. And creating a, a, a way for government to work with that civil Correct. society. How does that happen? Because right now it, it, it's in conflict right. with one another, or it's in spite of each other, or it's in lieu of each other. The whole concept of wraparound benefits that the, that, the, that the civil society sector is working on is to, well, government's kind of doing this and it's separate and distinct, and in some ways it's counterproductive, so we need to wrap around and try and fix this. I imagine if we didn't have to think like that. So how do you, how do you not think like what's the What's the well, way to get from here to what you're talking our about? Our better way plan, we have a, a specific solution and approach, which means getting getting things back to the states, uh, but not, I know everybody loves, hates the block grant word. It's not just some crude you know, spending cut exercise. It's making sure that these resources can be tailor-made and they must go to the poor. They must go to the purpose. They can't be used to pad some budget or build a road or something like that. They must go toward their intended purpose, and, and we have to measure and test results. Uh, McPhee is a good program, which is the, the homeless. We, we, we did the homeless programs in the Bush administration um, with, with just beta tests of these ideas of testing results and going with what works. I really think that's the solution here, which mm -hmm. is give um, local uh, officials the ability to consolidate, to combine, uh, to test, allow multiple providers to compete for the person's business and treat them like a client, not like you know um, some some commodity, and and test results. So, it, it, by and large, does this connective tissue between civil society and the government programs exist in most places, or is it non-existent? No, it, right it, it's in lieu of. I mean, civil society exists. I would say that in many places, government displaces civil society. Right. Government um, pushes it aside, ignores it or in some cases um, uh, dis uh, disallows it to breathe. It, it traps it with regulations. 
And, and never forget, at the end of this, I'm kind of going full circle here, you've got to have a growing economy. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to have a growing economy to produce the opportunities that you can help people recognize and realize. You know, if you step back from this and you try to figure out what's, what has and what hasn't worked, you know, TANF replaced <clears throat> AFDC about 20 years ago. Um, why hasn't there been more progress in those 20 years? TANF did work. It lowered child poverty rates. Uh, it, helped, it helped lower child poverty rates more than any other reform that we had seen. TANF is a $16.5 billion program. Uh, it's one program. And there are 72 other programs that spend about $800 billion a year. Mm. And so that reform, which was more local control, work requirements, time limits, uh, which was it, the work requirements kind of atrophied. And I, these guys can explain more about how that happened over the years. And <laughs> Robert can give you a chapter and verse on that. But it was one program out of dozens and dozens of other programs that never got those reforms, that never got those principles injected into them. And so I think what ended up happening is, is the system sort of took over those ideas and those principles. And it's, it's time for a new round of welfare reform, welfare reform 2.0. And again, this is not a budget exercise. This should not be seen like that. This should be seen as a life-saving exercise. This should be seen as a civil society, poverty-fighting expertise, uh, you know, respecting exercise. And that, to me is where this all ought to go. So you're saying essentially the, the centrality of work in all of these programs is, was, was true with TANF, it's still true now, it's still where you're, but it's, you're, but it's, you're but, starting But the centrality work. of work has been displaced by other programs, by the, the, we call it the poverty trap, by stacking all these benefits on top of one another. Um, you know, the highest tax rate is not Warren Buffett, it is uh, the single mom, you know, who may, who's getting 24 grand in benefits with two kids who will lose 80 cents on the dollar if she gets a good job offer. Uh, it, it will pay not to work. Why would we ever want to do that? Yeah. So you, but how do you get at that without, uh, it's hard to do that from Washington with some new formula. Um, I think EITC and things like that can help, but you, you need to be able to customize benefits. You need to be able to test results. And that, the other thing is we don't have all the ideas. There are people out there in communities who do have good ideas. Let's see them, learn from them, Push them, test them, and then again, let's get to this. I love the the, the evidence-based policy um, mindset is here, and the evidence-based policy notion is is a 21st century creation um, based on data, based on evidence that is here to stay, and let's see it through. And that, to me, is is, is sort of the topper of all of this, which is test results and go with evidence and go with what works. And right now, we don't, we're, not, we're, not, we're not able to do that because of government. In the wake of this election that we started out talking about, is there some tension between, um, the, again, the working class poor and the, sort of the traditional non-working poor? Because it, it, you sense some of that in the electorate this year, that there was a certain amount of resentment. Do those things now, at this point, it, and you're basically, I think, describing a situation in which things ought to be pu pushing for both those classes of people in the same direction, but is there some tension between them and could they work in opposite directions? They shouldn't be and no one should ever try to exploit it. I can't stand identity politics, no matter who plays it. And it's just wrong. And unfortunately, that we have seen identity politics a lot, uh, just in the last you know, handful of years. And so these are not, these, this is not a zero sum game. This is, this is, some person's gain does not come at another person's loss. That is not how a dynamic growing economy and a dynamic society works. And so uh, I certainly don't see it that way. Um, people may see it that mm -hmm. way, and we have to labor to make sure that they realize that that is not what it is. A growing economy with opportunity and upward mobility and encouraging work and, and upward mobility is good for everyone, and it's good for all of society. And uh, the, the, the notion that I think we have to attack, um, which I'm excited about seeing a group like this instead of just five people around Jack Kemp's <laughs> conference table, is that I think, unfortunately and indirectly, we, as in society, have re reinforced this idea that the war on poverty is a government responsibility. Mm. You know, pay your taxes, and we got, we got the rest. Don't get involved. You don't have to do anything. You're busy in your life. You know, it's two, two income earners in a household. And, they, and we re reinforce this idea. This isn't your problem. If you pay your taxes, government will fix this. That's wrong. It's dead wrong. 
and we need everybody to get involved in this. We need everyone's ideas and talents, and we need to reinvigorate and reintegrate the poor, all forms of poverty, into our society again. And we have done too much displacing of this. There has been books written on this. Mm. Bob Putnam writes a, bu a bunch of stuff on this about how we're self-segregating ourselves into various classes, into various groups, and if our politics tries to exploit it, that, that's, that's, we're going in the wrong direction. Our politics needs to break down those barriers and seek policies that stop the stratification of our society and get back to this beautiful idea of the American idea of the melting pot or whatever you want to call it. And that, to me, is uh, the challenge that's in front of us right now and the opportunity that's in front of us. So I, I think it's, it's fair to say that you and the House Republican Caucus have kind of established your bona fides on this issue because of what you, the work you did over the last couple of years. What about the incoming Trump administration? What's your sense? Have you had any conversations with them? I talked to him a lot. I've brought this up with him a bunch of times, and he has as well uh, un, unprompted. I, I think there's enthusiasm and desire. Uh, I think we've spent a lot of our time working on this, uh, so we're probably farther down the path uh, on this issue. But I sense nothing but enthusiasm and desire to get moving on this. And I've, I've spoke with Donald Friday about this. So I, I do believe uh, that there's, there's a big desire and a lot of enthusiasm for this. You have the lead on it? Is that fair to say? Well, Congress starts, we, I mean, all bills start in the House and, and run through Congress. And um, so oh, there's this so other they branch. say. There's this other <laughs> thing called the Senate. I forget about those guys yeah. sometimes. Um, yeah. It's just what I was going to ask about. Yeah, yeah right. are those guys? Um, so, yeah, this is something that, that we're, I, I don't know if lead's the right word. It's just, we, we, this is a high, very high priority, and we all, want it, we all plan on working on this. So, you know, as you, as you move down that path, um, you know, I wonder how you deal with the, um, there's a kind of a, a, a long-term um, notion of getting this right, so it works in the long run. There's also the very short-term kind of human element here, which is that relief is needed by some people right now. How do you reconcile those two as you move down this path? Because really transitions are hard. It's a good question. Uh, transitions are hard. The sooner you can act, the better you're going to be. And I, I really think if we can get some growth in the economy pretty quickly, that's important. So growth to me is, is sort of the initial shock that the system needs. Um, I think the fastest transmission for growth policy is regulatory relief. Mm -hmm. Look, people in Congress know this because we represent you know, um, our districts, but I hear probably more about the strangulation of regulations on businesses and their growth and their development than probably anything else, mm -hmm. even more than, say, tax policy. And I think if we can provide regulatory relief right away, that can breathe a sigh of relief into the economy. It can in reignite animal spirits. And if we can get um, our tax policies right pretty soon, those two combinations will help alleviate uh, Getting good economic growth can fix a lot of problems. Doesn't fix them all. You've got this. But I think that can help. You've help got this change. Congress Review Act that Newt Gingrich provided right. you. Yeah, the CR, the, the, we're going through that analysis right now. What can the new administration do on their own? What's an executive order? What does a new cabinet secretary, you know, do with regulations? And then what do we do with with the Congressional Review Act? And that that analysis is something that we're going through right now. Uh, this administration is not done yet. The current one. So we. We have to wait and see if they try to do something at the last minute that we'll get with the CRA. So th that is the analysis we're going through right now. Um, there's one other element of, the, of this package that tends to get overlooked, but that in, in the real world you can't overlook, which is health care. Um, if you were in a, if you're in a world in which you're repealing and replacing uh, Obamacare over the next, you pick the number of months, 18 months, um, and that involves considerable changes in the way Medicaid has been changed because of the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. How do you make sure health care doesn't become the showstopper for the very people you're trying to help? Yeah, it's do? a really, it's a, it's, well, I think the states have done a fantastic job in some instances with, with good waivers to actually get better reforms. Indiana is a perfect example. Uh, this is something that Mike Seema Verma, who's going to be the new CMS director, uh, was originally a Mitch Daniels person who was the architect of their, they call it Healthy Indiana. Uh, which has done a very, very good job uh, of, of getting health care to the poor that they can actually get in access. The problem with Medicaid that a lot of people outside of states don't see is most doctors won't take it. It's a lost yeah. leader. Yeah. The hospitals have to, but they don't want it. And doctors 
a lot of doctors won't take it. Uh, then you can talk about dentists and the rest. So it, 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 there isn't, there's a huge access problem. And I think by giving states the ability to craft reforms um, that, that are unique to their states, like we have Badger Care in Wisconsin and Healthy Indiana, those are two I'm pretty familiar with, uh, we can do a much better job of actually getting people not just affordable health care, but actual access to health, not just insurance, but health care. And that is a problem with Medicaid right now. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a program with dire fiscal problems, and it's a program that the provider community um, is, 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 is struggling with. We're, we're running just about out of time, so let me, let me step back and ask you a, a final big picture question here, which is, you know, this is, transitions are a time for both confusion and optimism, I suppose. Um, how optimistic are you you can get there, and what's the timetable? How how fast, how slow, how difficult to get from here to the kind of uh, changes you're talking about? Well, these changes, the, the big ones we're talking about, and, and whether it's welfare or healthcare, take time. Uh, but as far as the legislative process, we're, we're working on an aggressive timetable for 2017. We're right now sitting down with Senator McConnell and the Trump administration, the, in, the transition team, to try and flesh out what we think is a realistic timetable uh, so that we get the legislation um, prepped and ready to go. Uh, Transmitting the policy once the legislation is done takes time. Uh, again, if we can get some growth going, that's, that's a huge accelerant. But uh, let's just take the, the poverty stuff we're talking about. Um, TANF was one out of dozens of programs, and it took a long time to get those into place. I see, I see John English standing over here. He and Tommy Thompson are the, are the architects of that idea. And I don't know how long it took from you know 1996 passing that bill to Michigan putting it in place and, and getting it on the ground. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, ho I think today so we can better get started. Faster. Faster. <laughs> yeah, right. So it just takes time. Uh, yeah. Um, and is the Senate the graveyard? <laughs> I can think of a few other words. Too. <laughs> no, yeah. Go no, ahead. No, it's just they're a patient system. It's the saucer, you know, the, it's, 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 it's just... We can move pretty fast. We play rugby, they play golf. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, the, that's the analogy I use. Uh, but, um, but I do believe there's, we have a good plan. Uh, and a lot of this should be bipartisan. A lot of this stuff does not need to be us against them. This does not need to be, you know, Packers versus the Bears, which the Packers will beat the Bears this Sunday. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure of it. But, <laughs> but uh, this doesn't have to be so partisan. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's not the case. And, you know, the tax reform or Obamacare, I understand that there, there's ideological differences and that that's, is what it is and that's fine. But on a lot of these things, I just think we're getting hopefully to a consensus on just common sense that, that of what it takes to get these things done. Okay. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can make a difference that way. We can close out on common sense. So uh, you've got your hands full, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me and with the whole group. Enjoy here. this warm weather. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>